Have you ever been in a situation where you needed help? Anyone ever been in a situation where you needed help? I'm like, good grief, I'm going to go home if I'm only going to talk to myself today. Something maybe you couldn't resolve on your own. Uh, maybe it was a project that you were working on where you found out that you were way in over your head. Um, or maybe you were moving and you needed help, you know, lifting all the heavy things. Um, hopefully you weren't in jail and needed bailed out. Um, you know, hopefully we don't go to that far. But um, we get the idea that we all need help at some point in our lives. But the problem is um, we don't like to admit it. We don't like people to help. Because we want to be able to do it all ourselves, and we, don't want, we like to say, we don't want to impose on you. We don't want to, you know, take your time away from, you know, whatever it is you're going to do, like sit on the couch and watch TV. But, you know, we don't want to impose, but really, it comes down to a pride issue. We just don't want to ask for help. Take, for instance, this story. Uh, Manning uh, was an inpatient was at an inpatient rehab center with 25 other chemically dependent men, including a guy Manning just called Max. Max was a, a nominal Christian, uh, married with five kids. Um, he was owner of his own company and wealthy. Seemed like a, a pretty put together guy, but he'd been in and out of rehab for years and continued to relapse. Nothing helped. The counselor was determined that this time was going to be different. On this particular day, he started by asking Max about how much he drank. Max went into his usual mild-mannered denial, saying that his drinking was normal and he didn't really have a problem. The group leader interrupted and said, where's my phone? Somebody handed him his phone and he called the number. When a voice answered on the other end, he put it on speaker. It was the owner of the local tavern Max frequented. The counselor introduced himself and said, I'm here with Max and with his family's permission, I'm researching his drinking history. Could you tell me approximately how much Max drinks at your place? Oh, Max, he's a heck of a guy. Comes in here every day after work. He has five or six drinks a day, sometimes more, and he usually buys rounds for everybody. Everybody loves that guy. Max heard this and erupted in anger. He started questioning both the integrity and the ancestry of the tavern owner and the counselor. Then he quickly regained his composure and said something about how even Jesus got angry at times. Then the counselor asked Max, has your drinking affected your children? Have you ever been unkind to one of your kids? Max said, I'm glad you brought that up. Two of my sons graduated from Ivy League schools, and Max Jr. is in his third year at... I didn't ask you that, the counselor jumped in. At least once in his life, every father has been unkind to one of his kids. So give us one example. A long pause ensued. Finally, Max said, well... I was a little thoughtless with my daughter on Christmas Eve. What happened, the counselor asked. Max said, I don't remember. I get this heavy feeling whenever I, I think about it, though. What happened? Max's voice rose in anger. I told you, I don't remember. I'm sure it wasn't that bad. The counselor called another number. <laughs> Good morning, ma'am. This is Max's counselor. We're in the middle of a group session, and your husband has just told us that he was unkind to his daughter on Christmas Eve. Can you give me the details, please? It seems like it happened yesterday, the soft voice said. Our nine-year-old wanted a pair of shoes for Christmas. So on the afternoon of the 24th, Max drove her to the store and told her to get whatever shoes she wanted. When she climbed back into the truck he was driving, she kissed him on the cheek and told him he was the best daddy in the whole world. He was so proud of himself, he decided to celebrate. 
He stopped at the tavern and told our daughter he would be right out. It was an extremely cold day, about 12 below zero. Max left the motor running and locked both doors because he couldn't take, he couldn't take our little daughter into the bar. It was only going to be one drink. It was a little after three o'clock and my husband met some old army buddies, lost track of time and came out of the tavern at midnight drunk. The truck had stopped running and the windows were frozen shut. Our daughter was badly frostbitten on both ears and on her fingers. When we got her to the hospital, the doctors had to operate. They amputated the thumb and forefinger on her right hand. She will be deaf for the rest of her life. Max collapsed to the floor, sobbing uncontrollably. Then the counselor surprised everybody in the group by saying this to Max. There's the door over there. Pack your bags and get out of here. This is rehab for alcoholics, not liars. After a few moments, Max's sobbing turned into pleading to be allowed to stay in treatment. He began talking at length about what he had done and how he had hated himself for it. And the counselor and the group began to help him work through it. He had come to a place of deep regret and he knew he needed to start over. Manning finished the story this way. Max proceeded to, to undergo the most strict striking personality change I have ever witnessed. He became the most open, sincere, vulnerable, and caring person in the group. He found a real personal relationship with God, got sober, and stayed sober for the first time in his adult life. You see, for a lot of us, we're a lot like Max. It takes the extreme to get our attention. Because you see, Max thought that he, if he just blocked out what had happened, if he just left it in the past, that he would never have to deal with it. But you see, by him drinking and constantly getting drunk, that was his way of dealing with it. He wasn't actually dealing with the problem because to him, he didn't need help. So what he had to realize was that we all need help. Let's listen to Melissa's story. My journey started when I was two years old and my mom and my um, dad divorced. And I, we had lived with my grandmother for a long time. And my grandmother and I did not have a good relationship. I met my ex-husband when I was a junior, met at a bar. I didn't really know who I was though at 16, 17 years old to be in, in love or even know what it meant. It was just something was missing, but I just was so in the moment and wanted like to get married and the whole fairy tale that I kind of pushed those feelings aside. Um, once we had my daughter, it definitely took a turn for the worse. His behavior changed and my behavior changed. And then once I found out I was pregnant with my son, I felt like I was just stuck. I, you know, I have two kids and I definitely don't want to be a single mom with two kids. So I knew something had to change and I just kind of went the wrong way to make that change. Um, I had an affair and then on Father's Day weekend, I had another affair. I think from the beginning of being with a grandmother that treated me like a piece of crap to now being in a relationship that I'm just destroyed and slept with multiple men, but there was no God. And if he was there, he was not a nice person. So, I mean, I would, I would pray. I didn't know who I was praying to. I just kind of, someone's there, so hear me. And you probably hate me. And why would you let this happen? The last affair I had um, turned into a relationship. It lasted three years and it was a living hell. I was emotionally and physically abused, and my son was physically abused. Scissors being thrown, TVs being thrown, you know, me locked in a room with a gun to my head, and they were just on the other side screaming. And during, during that time, I became a drug addict. I was on coke, and I drank a lot, and it lasted three years because I didn't know how to get out of it. So the only way I was able to get out of it was um, I moved. 
So I moved and didn't know where I was. Before I moved, I met my now husband. The first day I met him, we like literally an hour after I met him, we ate at a TGI Fridays. We told each other stuff and there was no judging because we both were there. <laughs> we both had similar stories, it was scary. So I sobered myself up, still had no God, but just knew I needed to do something because I was probably going to lose my kids. So we decided to get married and before we did, we found the church. Everyone was amazing with our kids and where they should go and we, it was, it was life changing. It is life changing for, it was, it was amazing. When once the first service that we went to, we knew we needed to get baptized before we got married. That we needed to wash all the sins that we have committed in our previous marriages before me and him committed to each other. For years, many years, my husband and I both tried to do it on our own and that wasn't working. So now we have a place that we could turn to um, when we need it. It's a relief. It's definitely a relief in any part of our relationship. If we have a troublesome moment, we turn to God, we pray. We're not going to drugs and alcohol and affairs. We're going to God. So that is a relief to have that. In our small group, people who message me daily, what can we pray for you about? It's an awesome feeling. It's a place that I am comforted and loved unconditionally, no matter what. It's what a home should feel like, and it does. So we started out week one of this series, looking at the first awakening, the awakening to longing. We all have the longing to be loved and a longing to have purpose for our days and a longing to find meaning when life just kind of throws the hard things at us. We have this uh, longing that can really only be met by God, but yet we still try to, to meet those longings and those desires other places. And before long, we find that we have done things that we didn't think we would ever do. We made decisions we never wanted to make, and we come to our second awakening, the awakening to regret of having the regret and what can happen is we enter into this sorry cycle of we have these longings that we want to meet but then we have the regret by how we went about meeting them but instead of doing the next step we just continue the cycle we just go back to those longings and go back to the old ways that we seek to meet those longings and then we have days of regret and but we never take that next step. A lot of times we get caught in that cycle. They're, these awakenings, they're not just simply things that you will go through once in your life, but they're things that you'll come back to continuously in your life. There are things that you will have to come back to and, and maybe certain steps you won't need to, to stay there as long. Hopefully, you don't get in the sorry cycle and, and you can go from regret to the next awakening. It's kind of like, um, for example, um, Alcoholics Anonymous. Is anyone familiar with like the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous? It's okay, you don't have to be an alcoholic to know the 12 steps. I mean, it's okay to, you know, you're not saying I'm an alcoholic if you know the 12 steps. Um, I'm not an alcoholic. I know the 12 steps. Uh, does anyone know the first step? The first step is really the most important step. It's to admit that we're powerless over our addiction. Talk to any alcoholic, talk to any addict, talk to anyone who's been through the 12 steps, a counselor, and they'll tell you that 80% of the battle is done in step one. Because the hardest part is to admit that you're helpless. That you're in this situation because of everything else you've tried on your own. Stop trying those things. They're not working. But we don't want to admit that we need help. And that being the third, the third awakening. The awakening to help. Richard Rohr says this. We would rather be ruined than changed. 
We would rather die in our dread than climb the cross of the present and let our illusions die. We would rather live in what we think than actually take the chance in reality and ask for help. In Luke chapter 15, we've been looking at this story of the prodigal son. In verses 17, he says, When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare, and here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my, and go back to my father and, stay and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So we talked about last week that the first thing that we see that he did was he came to his senses. We talked about this word that is used here, repent, to repent of your sins, and that there's two kind of translations of it. There's the Greek and then there's the Hebrew, but we like to just kind of use one of them, which is the, uh, the Greek um, means to, to turn. Then there's the Hebrew, which is teshuva, which means to return home. To, to return home. To have a changing of your mind, to realize that you have a regret, but also then to turn and to return home. You see, a lot of times we stop at the regret and we don't go anywhere. We don't go back to the place where we belong with God we stay in this moment of trying to do things ourselves. But then it says that he got up and he, he went to his father. He went to his father. He didn't stay in that place. He, he was tired of living in that regret. The third awakening really is a game changer. It's where everything really begins to fall into place and, and really change and transformation can happen in this, in this uh, awakening. So we've been going through this 30-day this prayer wager and this week's uh, prayer goes something like this. God, if you are real, make yourself real to me. Awaken in me the willingness to turn toward you for help. God, awaken in me the willingness to turn toward you for help. To realize that you're powerless. You're powerless over the things in your life that keep bringing you right back to the same place. Not learning anything from what happened in the past. But now is the time to say, okay, we need to get serious about this. We need God's help. What kind of God do we find that we come back home to? I want to look at that, I want because it's an important thing. What kind of father do we think is waiting for us when we come back home? Because that's a very and very important thing. There are so many women and children, really, that hate Father's Day. Why? Because their father was horrible to them treated them horrible it wasn't a day to celebrate dads it was a day to pray he wasn't around why there are people if you talk to enough people you'll find that they do not like the fact that people will refer to god as god the father because just hearing father just turns them off and immediately they start to think of god as this person like their father was that he's this cruel person that is going to judge you for everything you've done and he's just waiting to punish you for something maybe you didn't even do. So what kind of father is it that's, that's waiting on us? Well, really, it's the father that we see in the story of the prodigal son. Jesus tells us that the son walked the journey home. And then verse 20 it says, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him 
and was filled with compassion for him. And he ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and he kissed him. His father was looking. He never stopped looking. But when he finally sees him come over the horizon, it says that he runs to him. There's so much going on in that one little verse. First off, in the Middle Eastern time in the first century, a father running would have been undignified. It would have been humiliating. You didn't run. Because to run would mean that he would literally have to take his, which we call a skirt, but I don't know what they called it, but he would literally have to hike it up and he would be showing his legs. It, I mean, it was an undignified thing. Kind of like, here's kind of maybe what it would be a little similar to. Say a President Obama gets, he's coming down the steps of Air Force One, he gets to the bottom step, and then he just runs for the dignitaries and just runs up and gives them a big old hug. Anyone ever seen the President run other than being on a jog in the park? I mean, they all do that. Yeah. I've never seen a, a President run in a suit. No, because he's in a position of honor and respect and you don't do that, they come to you. There's no running involved. But it says that the father ran to the son. But there's something even more significant going on here. You see, in that time, what had really would have occurred was something like this. If the son would have been coming home, more than likely, he would have been greeted by the people in that village or in that community, and they would have, ve they would have meet, met him at the edge of the town. And they would have a pot in their hand. And as they met him coming into the town, they would have taken the pot and they would have broken it. Symbolizing that you are broken from the community. You have broken our trust. You have broken apart from us. You are no longer welcome here because of decisions that you made. You have to leave. So see, the father ran because the father knew that the most important thing was that he got to his son first. Because you see, he wanted his son to not hear any of the others say anything. The only message that he wanted his son to hear was that he was loved, that he was missed, that he's glad that his son has returned home. That's all he wanted his son to know that it didn't matter. As we read on, we even see that as the son begins to say what he had rehearsed so many times, that the father interrupts him, doesn't even let him finish because he doesn't care about what he had done in the past. All that he cared about was that you're my son and I love you. I don't care how broken you are. I love you. the ceremony that they would have done is literally called the kezaza, which is the cutting off. They would have literally cut them off from the community, not just the family, but the community. But the father running to the son and saying, there's no ceremony. None of that's gonna happen because you're here with me. No one gets to trump the father. No one has more authority than what the father does. You know, the father, or the son, he may have deserved this. He, he may have deserved what he did, and he may have deserved the ceremony of them being cut off from the community, from his family. But the father says, no. I don't care what you deserve. 
All I care about is that I love you. It doesn't matter what you've done. You need to understand that this is the God who waits for you. This is the God who who looks over the horizon and is constantly looking and searching for you. I'm sure that the Father had people to tell him many times, don't waste your time on him. He's gone. He treated you like trash. He said he'd rather wish you were dead. Forget him. But yet the Father continues to look at the horizon because he knows deep down in his heart that his son is coming home. He doesn't know when, but he knows in his heart that something's wrong. He knows in his heart that his son needs him. He knows that his son needs help. Have you ever been, as a parent, in a situation where you know your child needs help? You want to step in, but it's kind of like, I can't step in until they ask me to. They need to learn. They need to learn that it's okay. They need to learn, one, it's okay to fail. And then when you do fail, that I'll still love you. But they also need to know that when they need help, their parents are there. Their parents are there to come beside them and help them do what they couldn't do. This this image of the father running to the son, it reminds me of a story of an Olympic athlete. If you don't know already, I'm a runner and I have ran track, cross country and all that stuff. And I I love to run, so I love these type of stories. And and one of them was of um, Derek Redman in the 1992 uh, Barcelona uh, Olympics. Um, His his whole career was just kind of plagued with injuries. And he actually had had undergone five different surgeries and he actually had... um, Um, a surgery on his Achilles tendon like four months before the Olympic Games. And things were looking great. He actually won, or he had the fastest recorded time in the first first time trials, and he won um, the the semi-qualifying to get him into the finals. And then everything was looking great, and then things kind of took a turn. So let's watch this. One, just to let you know how strong he is, he actually tore his hamstring and still was able to do that. But guess who the man was that came up beside him? His dad. It's hard to hear with the crowd was actually chanting his name. The father actually, he lips, he's finishing. Leave him alone. You see, his father knew what was, what was in his son's heart. He knew that his son had one goal. It wasn't to cross the finish line in a certain amount of time. It was to be in the Olympics and to finish, to cross the line. But he needed the father's help. He needed his father's help. We have to come to that place of realizing that help has a name and its name is Jesus. Jesus wants to be just like that father. He wants to come alongside you and help you in life's trials. It hurts him to see you hurt. Your suffering is his suffering. But you know what hurts the father the most? when we don't ask for help. Because he just has to sit there and watch us. 
He knows he can help. He knows he has a better solution than the things that we've tried. He knows that he can come alongside us and get rid of all of that pain and suffering if we just let him. If we would just let him. See, the beauty of it is, I love how C.S. Lewis put this. He said, the only way for Hamlet, the only way Hamlet could, to, could discover anything about Shakespeare would be if Shakespeare wrote himself into the play. That's the same way about God. The only way that we could know about God was if he wrote himself into the play. And so we literally see this image of the prodigal son it's, it's a made-up story. It's, it's a fictional story, but really, it's our story. It's each one of us. And the story of the father is a father that is looking towards the horizon, and he's waiting. He may be still working. He may be still doing the things that he needs to get done, but he's, he's looking. He, he's aware of where you are. He's aware of the things that are going on in your life and he's just waiting for that moment. But you say, God, I need your help. God, I can't do this. I need your help. He's just waiting to run to you. He doesn't care how undignified, he doesn't care how humiliating it may be for him to have to run to you because he wants to. I don't know how many times I think about myself in awkward situations and it's like, I don't want to humiliate myself. I don't want to do that. It's awkward. But to think that Jesus is willing to put himself in that role and say, I don't care. I'm willing to do whatever it takes to be there for you, to walk by your side, to carry you if I have to. That's what he wants to do for us. So some of you, some of you wanted to ask God for help, and you were broken. You were full of jagged edges, and you were a mess. But maybe for some of you, somebody else got there before God did. Maybe for some of you, that person claimed to be a Christian and said you weren't good enough to be here, that you weren't like us. But here's the beauty. It doesn't matter what they said. It, it doesn't matter. Because here's the point, nothing they say matters. They don't get a say. They have no say. It's, it, it's nothing. Because the only person that gets to have a value, that gets to have an impact on your life, that gets to say how valuable you are to this world is God. The creator, the person who created you. And the beauty of it is, is he says, I don't care what you look like. Because I'm in the one type of business, and that's making all things new. Because, see, he can take the, the brokenness. He can take what other people have done to you. He can, he can take that brokenness in your life, and he can make it new. He doesn't just sit up here. I thought about, like, how can I illustrate this better? And I thought about sitting up here with, like, a, you know, super glue and trying to glue this back together. But it was like, you know what? That's not what God does. God doesn't just sit there and try to put all of your little pieces back together. He says, no, here's what we're going to do. Get rid of that old thing. And he puts up a brand new shiny pot. He says, this is who I created you to be. This is who you are. You're beautiful. I love you. And that stuff doesn't matter. I don't care what anyone else has told you. I care about one thing, and that is who you are and who I created you to be, and that is beautiful inside and out. 
But here's the thing. If we don't ask for help, God doesn't run. If we don't ask for help, God stays right where he is. Why? Why? Why doesn't God just constantly come and constantly try? He does, but from a distance. Because you see, the only way that him helping us will ever work is if we admit we're powerless. If we admit that we don't have the power. If we admit that the things in our life, we really, we've messed them up. We haven't made them better. We need someone, something to come alongside us and help us be who we were created to be. And it's when we admit that we're powerless, it's when we admit we need help, God comes running. He's not waiting for days and months and let's see if they're really honest about this. No, it's when he feels and hears the call, he's coming. But will we ask for help? Will we ask for help? You know, we, we've been meeting now for, I, this will upcoming Tuesday will be three weeks in this life group. It's been a small group and that's perfectly fine. I don't care because we've had great discussions. But you know, this is the type of atmosphere in a small group setting where you can be vulnerable, where you can ask for help. And you can flesh out things that are going on, and it's okay. It's, I mean, the whole thing is confidential. Like, nothing gets shared, like, outside the meeting. If it does, you're, you're gone. Just because it's so important, you, you have to keep it between the group. But I encourage you, I challenge you to come and join us, because this is a big one. This is, this is the one that a lot of us don't want to go to. Because I'll be honest with you, and you know, as I've been thinking about this whole small group thing, and it's like, you know, I wanted to do a series that would be challenging to kind of start this whole life group thing, but then it was like I was getting into it, and I was like, oh my, I think I might have chosen the wrong series to start with because this is some hard stuff to deal with. But see, here's the reason why, is because we need each other. We need each other. We need to be able to find a place where it's safe, where it's okay to, to share. And if you're uncomfortable about what goes on in the group or you're not sure about what, just come. You don't have to say anything if you don't want to. Just come and see what the group is about. Get your bearings about you and you share when you're ready to share. You talk when, I mean, we don't just sit there and say, so what's going on in your life today? I mean, I mean, it's Bible-based. I mean, we go th we're reading through the Bible. We're looking at different things in Scripture, and we're asking questions. You know, this next week, we're going to be looking at, why is it so hard to ask for help? What is the real reason? So I challenge you to be vulnerable, because it's when we're vulnerable that we're growing. When we're open and honest with each other. If you want to be fake and, you know, don't come. Because quite honestly, you're not doing any of us any good. You know, it's really hard for me sometimes to sit in a group like this and be your pastor because it's like, I can't share some of the stuff. If I tell them some of the stuff I've got going on in my life, they're never going to come back to church again. And now I've got your mind just rolling. You're, it's not that bad. But the thing is, I want you guys, I don't want to be fake in front of you. I, I want to be who I am. I mean, I'm no different than you. 
I have a, you know, a special degree on my wall. Whoopie-doo. I mean, that's what qualifies me as a pastor. We're all qualified for that. So. But my challenge to you is to ask Jesus for help. Don't wait. Don't continue to get in that cycle of longing and regret. But ask God for help. Because it's when we ask God for help that we find that he makes us new. That he makes us who we were created to be. And here's the thing you need to understand. The second you ask for help, it, it's not like a magic little thing and everything is perfect. All of your problems are gone. That's not how it works. I wish, <laughs> but it's not. It's a process. It, it's growing. It's growing. It's learning about you. It's learning about God. It's learning to trust him. It's a process. So I challenge you to just ask Jesus for help. Let him be who he wants to be for you. So as Jeff comes, we're, we're going to sing a, an appropriate song. We've already sang it once this series, I don't know, whatever, it's a great song, but it's redeemed. Don't just sing the words, hear the words. It's a beautiful song because we are redeemed. He's taken what was broken and made it brand new. <laughs>